Dear all, me direct thanks you for joining this webinar, the 8 in our me direct talk series, where we aim to introduce you to financial experts and asset managers, so that they can share their views on the financial markets and investment opportunities with you. Me direct has always been at the forefront of providing you with the latest on the investment world, and we aim to continue doing so through our regular updates on our website and social media. Our team of experienced wealth advisors are always available to assist you. For this edition, we have partnered up with Fund Smith Equity Fund. Terry Smith will be giving an update on the performance of the fund, together with his views on the financial world and the current trends. Good afternoon, everybody. There's a disclaimer, which you know we were obliged to show you and which you should study, but you probably have seen quite a few of those. So we'll go on to the topics here. Here's what I want to cover today. Uh, obviously, performance, uh, just a brief um, look again at our investment strategy, just to remind ourselves what it is and see if we're sticking to it and no style drift, hopefully. Um, then a few sort of topical things, uh, rotation. Uh, we've heard a lot about the rotation from uh, quality to value uh, and recovery stocks. Inflation, we're hearing a great deal about inflation. Uh, so something, a word or two about that. Uh, ESG, difficult to talk about asset management now without uh, uh, saying something about ESG and a few other topics uh, that uh, briefly I want to touch upon. Uh, probably the thing that most people focus on the performance you'll see for the half year uh, the fund was up 13.1 percent that's the t-class uh, accumulation shares and uh, in sterling with dividends reinvested the uh, equities which is the msci in sterling with dividends reinvested was up 11.9 percent uh, so we outperformed it by a bit over one percent during the period um, if you've been reading some of the uh, uh, headlines from the commentators during the, uh, the half year as things went along you might be rather surprised by that, uh, I would say. Um, looking across to the right, the longer term performance, which is somewhat more important, annualized 18.7% per annum since inception, uh, equity is 12.5%, so we've outperformed it by about 6%. And our Sharp and Saltino ratios, you'll see at 1.11 versus 0.56 for the index, and 1.06 versus 0.52. In both cases, we're delivering about uh, two units of, uh, of performance for every one unit of risk, in this case measured obviously by uh, price variation. Not a measure of risk I'm particularly fond of, but it's the one most commonly in use. Uh, and I think that's, that is, it does have some importance because people's ability to behave logically and not do themselves harm in investment terms if they experience high volatility in their investments is low. Now, what were the biggest contributors and detractors in the half year? You can see the contributors, PayPal, Microsoft, IDEX, Facebook and Intuit. I suppose the only common theme that you could perhaps draw out from those is that maybe four out of the five are about the transformation to digital business. PayPal in payments, Microsoft in operating systems and communications like we're using right now, uh, Facebook in social media and digital advertising and Intuit in accounting and tax software. IDEX, not so, obviously it's a veterinary diagnostic equipment company. Uh, that's at work there. I mean, the other thing that continues to illustrate is um, at least four out of the five. Uh, are, this is one of their multiple appearances in our largest contributors uh, box. Um, as I always say, so much for the theory that uh, you should take profits. Uh, it seems to me certainly so far that um, uh, not taking profits has actually been the right way to handle the, uh, the fact that we've got some of these stocks somewhat right in terms of our ownership of them. In terms of the detractors, there's no particular rhyme or reason to the to the detractors. I would say Amadeus is a pretty obvious one uh, in terms of airline reservations still being depressed uh, in the, the travel market. Brown Foreman, uh, it's obviously been without the travel retail market and without the on-premise drinking business during this period. So it's suffered a bit uh, from that, which hopefully will recover. And then the other three are all consumer staples, McCormick, Unilever and PepsiCo. And I guess to a degree, it's about them lapping the sort of the heavy pantry loading purchases of, uh, of this time last year uh, that they were experiencing. But uh, there's not an obvious theme uh, to combining those, but I guess we'll get a clearer picture one would hope that when we've got the full year numbers. Our investment strategy, uh, as you hopefully know by now, we've got a very simple three-step uh, investment process. Try to only invest in good companies. Try not to overpay when buying the shares and when holding the shares, and then endeavor to do nothing. And uh, I'm going to take you through each of those steps. So the first one, only invest in good companies. On the next slide, that's it. And you will see this is our look through table. This is where we look at the, um, uh, the operating and balance sheets uh, numbers 
for our companies for five metrics here during any one reporting period. And in, in so doing, give you a picture of what our companies are like. So we take those numbers for each of the companies, wait them for their positioning index, and tell you what the look through looks like. And you can see, um, you know, obviously, we're looking back to 2020 here, so it's a little bit in the rearview mirror. But the return on capital employed last year was not unaffected by the COVID. It was 25%, down 29% the previous year. Uh, you know, we did have some companies like Amadeus, like IHG, which were quite heavily affected, um, but not that many. Um, it's still a head a lot better than the index, though. So you can see the S&P at 11%, the FTSE at 10%. So even with that kind of effect, our companies are still making about two and a half times the index return. And if that's the worst thing that happens to us, frankly, I'll, I'll buy it every day of the week. Uh, gross margin, again, very slight decline last year. Nothing really that you could uh, say was measurable, 65% against 16%. Uh, 6% the previous year. I mean, to put that in English, this is the difference between revenues and cost of goods sold. Our companies are making things for 35 and selling them for 100. Uh, in contrast, the index you'll see is around 40%, just a bit over. The index is making things for 60 uh, and selling them for 100. Clearly, it's better to make things for 35 and sell them for 100. So the companies take in uh, ingredients, components and services and turn them into products that they mark up the price on those inputs to sell. And um, clearly our companies have got an awful lot bigger markup than, uh, than the index, and that's a better position. I also want to come back to it when we uh, look at the subject of inflation, because it's the single biggest indicator, I think, of two things. One is pricing power, and the other one is the protection you've got when prices change. Uh, that is input prices change. Um, if you take out the selling general and administrative expenses and get to the operating margin, which is the one most people seem to spend their time focusing on. Again, not unaffected last year. Our companies had 23% operating margins, down from 27. So, yep, they did suffer a little in the downturn, um, but nothing like as much as the index. You see the index is respectively 12% on the S&P, 9% on the FTSE. Let's call it 10 or 11 as an average. Um, our companies are making twice the index return in terms of margins on their sales. Cash conversion, last year our companies converted 101% of their profits uh, into cash, pretty much on the money in terms of where they've been for the last seven or eight years. Uh, as you can see, how do you turn more than 100% of profits into cash? Well, there's more than one way of doing it, but the most common way is pay people more slowly than you get paid yourself, have more payables than uh, uh, than you've, uh, the, the, in terms of uh, what, what you basically owe people, than you've got creditors for what, you, uh, what you've taken in. Um, and uh, you can see the index was 94, 95% last year. That's quite a good number for the index. The index usually hovers around 80 to 85%. The reason for that is one of those curious things of ratios. The index had quite a big fall in sales for the companies in it generally, um, and also a rundown in working capital because uh, they had less activity. And the combination of those two ratios gave them a better cash conversion, ironically. They realized some of their stocks and didn't reorder it in, in a number of cases. Uh, and that gave them the fact that they made less cash, but it was a higher percentage of profit. So not quite as healthy as that comparison would lead you to believe. Uh, and lastly, interest cover. Um, you know, is all this being, all the, these good operating ratios really being generated uh, by uh, balance sheet um, uh, leverage? No, our company's uh, interest and rental uh, leases are covered 16 times by their operating profits. Pretty steady. I mean, same as the year before versus six time on the index. So. You know, as you know, there's not much we can promise you, uh, either legally or even if it wasn't against the, every regulation to promise you anything about performance. But the, you know, the one thing I would maintain is we own a bunch of companies with excellent operating ratios, and it's not just a one-off. This is not them having excellent operating ratios because they're in a year of recovery. They pretty consistently are good companies. Um, why is this of some importance? I think uh, you know, this is heading towards the subject of rotation, which I'll deal with more particularly a bit later. But an awful lot of people, obviously, when they're talking about buying value uh, stocks, lowly rated stocks, or when they're talking about recovery stocks, are talking about heading into buying low quality businesses, businesses with low returns on capital, for example, uh, as a, a value or recovery play. And one of the problems with that is that the returns that companies make, whether they're good or bad, are pretty persistent. You can see here you've got some uh, um, uh, data that was provided by GMO, the Boston-based uh, fund manager, and it looks at companies with high returns on, on equity, which is the red. You can see companies which are gravitating around the sort of 20% line over time. Uh, and then you can see ones with low returns on capital gravitating around that dotted line of 12%. And they've got this data back to 1966. They've got a pretty long run of data here. And you can see the companies in red don't become 
like the companies in green and vice versa. So the problem um, with the, the value or recovery type play is if you accept the proposition that in the long term, the return you get from your investment is driven by the returns the companies themselves get. And I think that's not a proposition. It's just a fact, actually. Uh, if you accept that, the problem with buying into the companies in green, which may be lowly valued, they may be in a recovery situation, is their price or valuation or the fact that they've got a recovery to look forward to isn't going to transform them into good businesses. If you're going to make that strategy work, you have to remember to do the bit where you sell them when you benefited from that. It's no good holding them in the long term. Bad businesses do not become good businesses or vice versa, basically. As the, the middle bullet point says there, there's only one way to really explain this phenomenon, uh, and it's basically about barriers to entry. That The companies that have got high returns on capital that persist have found something that has been popularized by the, the Warren Buffett term the moat. They have a means of fending off the competitors who come and try and take those returns off them. Typically things like brands, patents, know-how, control of distribution, network effects, etc., which they in combination deploy in order to fend off their competition. Uh, don't overpay, often the most vexed part of this uh, particular strategy, and it continues to be so. If you looked at us at the end of uh, uh, the period, you would see the free cash flow yield on our portfolio, that's the free cash flows paying for everything except the dividend. So the cash flows that belong to the um, uh, to the investors was 2.6%. And clearly our stocks were more expensive. They had a lower yield than either the FTSE or the S&P 500. Uh, and you can see that in that comparison. I would personally ignore the FTSE comparison. I put it in for completeness because I don't want you to think that we're trying to hide anything like that. But the, uh, the fact is the FTSE has an awful lot of uninvestable junk in it. And I don't think it's a great comparison. The better comparison is the S&P 500. And we are indeed more expensive uh, than the S&P. What you've got to ask yourselves and what we continue to ask ourselves is, yes, we may be more highly rated, but does that mean that we are so highly rated that these are, are uninvestable relative to the S&P in general? And I think the answer is no. If you think back to that slide uh, with the operating ratios on there, we are very, very significantly better than the S&P and our growth rate is better than the S&P. If you look at the bottom of the slide there, you'll see that last year uh, our free cash flows in our portfolio grew 8%. That's a pretty decent result considering the circumstances of last year, where as you saw from the earlier slides, it's not as if our companies were unaffected by the, uh, by the events of last year. Um, moving on. Um, on the subject of valuation, one of the things that you hear an awful lot is uh, tech in particular, which contrib contributes to about a third of our portfolio, uh, is overvalued. Well, is it? Um, uh, this is a slide that looks at companies that have got some pretty high valuations compared to a number of things like their revenues, cash flows and their income. And you see um, that if you look at the companies with zero revenue, there are 92 companies listed uh, with over a billion market cap with zero revenues, zero revenues. Six over five billion market cap with zero revenues, and one over 10 billion market cap uh, with zero revenues. That's um, kind of interesting. Um, if we look at uh, those that have got some revenues, under $100 million of revenues, you'll see the market cap over a billion, there's 588, which are over a billion dollars market cap with under $100 million of revenue. These companies are on 10 times sales or more. 50 over $5 billion market cap uh, with under $100 million. These are on 50 times revenues or more and eight over $10 billion market cap, you know, so on over 100 times revenues. And so it goes across. If you look at net income, you'll see there are 285 companies with no net income with over $10 billion market cap. Um, there are 250 companies with negative free cash flows with over $10 billion market cap. If there is a bubble or if there's a problem, I think you're looking at it there. I don't think you're looking at the sort of tech that we invest in. These are the big tech companies um, with their S&P rankings in terms of where they rank in valuation of the S&P on basis of PE and their actual PEs uh, in there. And some, as you see, their year-to-date price change and return on capital employed. Yes, there are some fairly highly valued big tech companies. Service now, you can see at the top there, the PE of 89, Salesforce with 66, Amazon with 59. We own PayPal on 55. That's our highest rated one of these companies. And we only insure it on 40 times. But you look down towards the bottom, you get to things like Facebook, which we own, which is on 25 times. I mean, it's actually pretty close to the valuation of the index, uh, if you look at it, in terms of uh, the, the index being on 21 times. 
Um, and this is a company, Facebook, with a 29% return on capital employed over to the right there versus 11% on, on the S&P. Uh, our friends, Microsoft, on 32 times, yeah, a bit more highly rated in the index, but 31% return on capital employed. Um, I guess what I would represent to you is if there is a problem in tech valuation, it's probably not in the tech of the sort that we are mostly interested in. Most of what we are interested in is not the uh, the leading edge former unicorn type businesses uh, that you saw on the previous slide. It, it's things that are represented here. We don't own all of them, but we are, as you can see, pretty much gravitated towards the lower two thirds or lower half of those valuations in the S&P 500. And it's also true if you take me on, I think, uh, of our wider portfolio. This is Fundsmith Equity Fund versus the S&P. Uh, and you can see these are the PEs and their S&P rankings, where one would be the highest ranked in the S&P and 500 would be the lowest ranked in the S&P. Yes, we do own Starbucks, which is 37th, but I think that's a bit of an artificial situation because it didn't actually have any earnings during the period, basically. So many Starbucks were closed uh, that it was obviously very highly rated, not because the share price had performed very strongly, but because the earnings had basically more or less disappeared. But yeah, PayPal was pretty highly rated. Sure, it's fairly high rated in IDEX, um, but then you start to work down, you get to you know quite a few that are quite a lot more lowly rated. You know, things like uh, McCormick, Facebook, uh, PepsiCo are around the average, and we've got Johnson & Johnson, Becton Dickinson, Philip Morris, uh, which are in the lower reaches of the index. So, you know, we've got a range. It is a portfolio. We've got some fairly highly rated growth stocks, our PayPal, our IDEX, our Intuit, and Nike in there, although Nike was also affected in the same way as Starbucks to a degree last year. And we've got some quite lowly rated stuff. There's not a uniform valuation across the portfolio. Do nothing. Uh, you can see in 2020, we had portfolio turnover of 4.1%, um, pretty average. If you look back over the last uh, six years before that, you can see we had 2%, 5%, 13% was our high in. 2018, negative turnover in three of the six years, which is to say we had more net cash inflow than the amount of turnover we engaged in, which just produces a negative number, which is pretty unhelpful. The cost of dealing is probably a more interesting thing. If you look at voluntary dealing costs, how much did we incur in trading for buying or selling things outside of the need to deploy firms? The answer is 0.03%, um, three basis points, three bips. We spent a bit under six million pounds on a fund that's over 20 billion. Uh, pounds of assets under management. So, you know, really quite a low dealing cost because the amount of activity we engage in is really quite low. Um, what did we actually do? Well, last year, I think most of you would have been through, we sold uh, a couple of our household uh, product and personal care businesses, Clorox and Reckitt Bank, is, uh, which had had a very good period during the second quarter of last year when uh, there was clearly big demand for their products, Clorox in household cleaning, Reckitt's in household cleaning and over-the-counter medicines. Um, and uh, both of them had, as a result, unusually high sales and very good share price performances, which we did not think were going to persist. And we took the opportunity of some very big share price weakness, over 40% falls in Nike uh, and Starbucks to buy into those two. They're two companies we've long followed and admired. And we also um, started buying a stake in LVMH. We've always wanted our own one of the luxury goods stocks. Um, we think we understand the area somewhat through our exposure through the cosmetics companies we own and the drinks companies we own, but we have nothing in the pure um, uh, apparel, um, designer goods, uh, accessories, uh, and so on, jewellery and watches. Uh, and so we basically thought we weren't going to get a better opportunity to buy into LVMH than the events in China at the height of the pandemic last year. So we started buying into those at the turn of the year. We also started buying Church and Dwight. It's also a consumer products company, but it's far more. Accent. It's, it's like Clorox, but the other way up. Clorox is a household cleaning products company, makes bleach, sanitary wipes and so on. Obviously, big demand during COVID. Uh, very little, but a small presence in the house, in the personal care products. Church and Dwight is the other way around. It's mostly in the personal care products here. So we switched into that. And uh, so far in 2021, we've made two sales. We sold Intertech, the UK based uh, uh, testing services business, uh, and we sold our stake in Sage, the UK accounting software business. We still have a quite a big exposure in the area because of our holding in Intuit uh, in, uh, in the uh, accounting and tax software business. Uh, rotation. Uh, we heard a lot uh, during the, uh, the back end of last year and the first half of this year about the rotation that uh, investors should or were uh, taking money out of uh, funds like ours and moving on into 
uh, or stocks of the sort that we own and moving into value stocks and recovery stocks uh, and so on and so forth. So I thought I'd better touch upon that subject. Um, I think this is an interesting slide. This shows the maximum drawdown on COVID for a number of counters. Um, what their recovery was from the, um, the low in the, in the COVID downturn to the date that we calculated. This was the 16th of June this year. Um, and then looking across the two, what if you had bought them at their low in COVID and run them through to the current price, basically? You can see our maximum drawdown was 17%. The S&P was 32%, the NASDAQ 29%. Uh, the S&P value index was down 35%. And then we've given you some individual counters of a sort that people like to own uh, for these uh, value or recovery situations. American Airlines, 69%, Exxon, 53%, JP Morgan, 40%. Uh, the FTSE was 32% down. BP was 60% down. Carnival Cruises, 84 Lloyds Bank, 61 And our good old friends, Ryanair, 47%. And then you can see in the middle column, the COVID recovery. If you'd have bought these at the low, what would you have made if you run it through to the 16th of June and uh, got your, your timing perfect in terms of the buying point? Well, you'd have made 46% in our fund. You'd have beaten that in the S&P 84, NASDAQ 104, S&P value 73, American Airlines 153. You get the drift. Uh, you know, lots of good returns to be made there. Interestingly, the FTSE, you'd only made 38%. The FTSE is really an index full of a lot of stuff that I personally uh, find unbestable. But really, the critical point I'm trying to make here is the, is the thing on the right. What if actually you'd been in at the low and run through to now? Um, what would you uh, across the whole period have got? The answer is, well, if you'd have just done nothing and held us 22 percent, S&P 25, Nasdaq 45, value 13 percent. American Airlines should still be net down 22 percent if you'd entered this with the American Airlines. Uh, this is a strategy and goes back to the point I was making earlier. Uh, that you can't uh, operate a buy and hold uh, approach to successfully, basically. You've got to be very good in terms of your timing and you've got to buy them and sell them. They won't hold as a, as a long term investment. Um, this is a great quote, I, I think. This is Jim Chanos, the uh, fund manager who runs Kinecos. Uh, and uh, he said uh, recently about the, the reopening stocks, which everybody got very excited about in the first half of the year in particular. He said, the worst thing that could happen for reopening stocks is that we reopen. And I think he's right. When we do reopen, uh, we're going to go back from a situation where there's not something to look forward to, but where we see these companies, whether they're oil companies or banks or airlines or cruise line companies, revert to what they somewhat what they were before. And the answer is they are not good businesses. This is just another way of looking at the, um, the slide that I put up earlier from, uh, from GMO. Uh, this is from McKinsey, so this is from a, a consultancy firm, and it looks at the uh, return on, in, uh, on invested capital, excluding goodwill, so it's looking at the return on operating, operating assets, and it looks at it across in industry sectors. You look, if you turn your head, you'll see the industry sectors laid out uh, on the horizontal axis, and it looks in two periods. The red bars are 1963 to 2004, so a 40 year run there. And the gray bars look from 1995 to 2004, so a more recent 30-year, uh, uh, more recent 10-year run, so a much shorter 10-year run period at the end of it, just to see whether there's been a change in conditions uh, for these companies. Have they changed their spots, basically? And you can see, no, they haven't. Basically, the high-return companies with the red bars are also the high-return companies with the gray bars. Now, some red bar companies, like down at the right, Utilities, telecoms, transport, energy, materials have not suddenly got grey bars, which are up in the 20-25% uh, bracket, nor have any of the really good sectors, pharmaceuticals, household and personal products, software, media, uh, commercial services, uh, semiconductors, uh, healthcare, food, beverage and tobacco. None of them have suddenly gone from having high red bars into having low grey bars. This is another example. Returns tend to be stable by industry and these these this data and the comments attached to it are not ours although i wholeheartedly agree with them they are those uh, of, of the people who supplied them gmo in one case and uh, mckinsey in the other case as they rightly point out here on the left these are not my comments these are the comments they made in their uh, in their report that accompanied this data industry with poor returns remain poor industries over time it's their basic fundamental economics that make them like this um, 
being cheap or lowly rated doesn't suddenly turn them into good companies. They persist in being bad companies. Um, yeah, rotation and interest rates. So we looked at rotation there a bit in terms of what result you would get if you got your timing right, what return you would get if you held them across the whole period. And I've looked at the, uh, the good company versus bad company persistence. This is another subject that's um, somewhat related, which is interest rates. What happens if interest rates go up? We've got inflation, which I want to deal with as a separate subject, maybe at the moment. Uh, what if that leads to higher interest rates? What happens? And you can see if we look back here, we're looking just back over the period since our inception. And we look at periods of rising interest rates and falling interest rates. And you can see, which we've provided by the color um, coordination we put in here, that there is a fairly consistent pattern. When interest rates rise, you can see them doing that from November uh, 2010 to February 2011. You can see there's a 90 bit uh, rise in rates. Yep, we tend to underperform, which is what this is showing, versus the S&P value. And S&P growth tends to underperform versus the S&P value. There it is, OK? And you can see when the rates come down uh, in the next column, we tend to outperform. You can see uh, between February 11 and June uh, 2012, uh, when the rates came off uh, close to 2%. Yep, we outperformed very significantly, and the S&P growth outperformed uh, S&P value very significantly. And that, across the table, leads you to a pretty consistent uh, uh, conclusion. Rates go up, we and growth underperform value a bit. Yep, unsurprising, what we own are long tail assets. You know, we looked earlier with the regard to valuation, the valuation on our shares is a bit higher. Uh, than it is on the market. Unsurprisingly, you know, Mr. Market doesn't give away good businesses to you very often at an average market rating or lower. That doesn't happen very often. Um, and so we are a bit more highly rated and therefore our top stocks tend to behave in the near term, but like they do here, rather like a long duration bond behaves versus a short duration bond in a rise in interest rates. In rise in interest rates, you lose more money in your long duration bond, you do in your short duration bond. For fairly obviously, because uh, uh, basically you've got cash flows discounted further out into the future. The rising rates has a bigger impact. Um, but again, there's another important point in this table. So we can see, you know, when rates go up, we underperform a bit. When rates go down, we outperform quite a bit. But if you look at those numbers and just eyeball them, you'll see they're not the same. The outperformances are a lot bigger than the underperformances. If you just look across that top line and look at the, the color of the, of, the, of the black numbers versus the red numbers. And then if you look over to the right, you can see since inception, uh, and you measure us versus the S&P value, 334%, and the S&P growth versus S&P value, 186%. You can try, if you wish, to play the game of predicting when interest rates will rise and try to capture these short-term periods of, of performance. Um, but if you just stick with it, with the strategy of owning the, uh, the, the, the good companies, the growth companies or the companies of the sort we own in our portfolio, which I would characterize more as quality companies, frankly, against the value stocks, you will outperform very significantly over long periods of time. Uh, and I would suggest that's a much easier strategy to deploy than trying to get, as we can see here, a series of several different rate uh, changes correct and, uh, and play the market on. Uh, inflation, obviously very closely linked subject because interest rate changes are at least to some extent driven by inflation. So have we got it first of all, or are we going to get it? Um, one of the things you'll hear an awful lot is, We've got inflation because commodity prices are going up. Well, you know, consumers don't buy commodities. Commodities are purchased by businesses, by companies who do things to the commodities and turn them into things that consumers buy. Consumers don't go out and buy the things that are named on this slide, lumber, iron, steel, fertilizers, gas, copper, oil, cotton. They go out and they buy things which companies have taken these inputs in and process. Even in oil, we don't buy oil. We buy petroleum or diesel or heating oil and so on and so forth. And this is an interesting uh, uh, chart, I think. It takes you back to variable periods, 1958 in the case of iron and steel and lumber, 1992 for natural gas, as you can see there, crude oil to 1991. And it basically looks at whether there's any correlation between the commodity price changes in here. This is the Federal Reserve's data, by the way, and the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. And the answer is there isn't any. Um, you know, the, the extremes at either end, the 100% at the top, the minus 100% at the bottom, would be a perfect positive or negative correlation. You can see there isn't any. There's a very weak positive correlation between the commodities in, uh, in red on the left 
And there's a slightly stronger, if anything, negative correlation between the, the, the CPI and the commodities on the right. So commodities uh, basically are not driving consumer prices. Um, what they're driving is the input costs of companies, which then supply things to consumers, which takes me on to my next point, if I may. Um, how are companies affected by um, uh, rises in input prices? And the answer is differentially, uh, basically. Here I've got two companies, and I've tried to model the two companies very simply on the slide I showed you earlier about our businesses versus the, uh, the index. So um, both of these companies are going to suffer from 5% inflation in their cost of goods sold, or COGS, as it says at the top of the slide there. Um, one of them is our average company in FET, so its revenues are 100, and its cost of goods sales is 34, leading to a growth profit margin of 66, which you saw on the slide earlier. Um, on the right, you've got the index, the S&P. This has got revenues of 100. Its cost of goods sold is 55, and, and its gross profit margin, therefore, is 45%. So there we are. There's our two starting companies. And I'm making the assumption here that neither of them is able to put up prices uh, in response to the input price um, uh, uh, rise, basically. Um, I'm also making the assumption that they're Selling general and military expenses, which you'll see is 39% for our companies. Our companies have high gross margin. They spend a bit more on, uh, on selling general and military expenses versus the 30% over in the uh, uh, S&P companies remain stable, basically. So what happens? The input costs go up by 5%. The cost of goods sold for our companies goes from 34 to 36% in round terms, uh, just rounding up. And the cost of goods sold for the S&P goes from 55 to 58%, again, rounding up. Um, as a result of that, if you work through the numbers, our companies will see a decline of 6% in operating profits, whereas the S&P will see a decline of 18%. Basically, our companies, through the fact that they've got much higher gross margins to start with, have much better insulation against these kind of things occurring. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, here's a live example, which takes two companies, uh, which are within companies of a sort that we follow, but at different ends of the spectrum. This is L'Oreal on the left, which we own. You can see revenues 100, cost of goods sold 27, gross margin 73. So basically, this is a company that's making things for 27 and selling them for 100. The ingredients don't cost much in cosmetics. It's selling general and expenses expenses are pretty chunky, 55% for all of that nice packaging and advertising that they do, uh, producing an operating profit of 18. And then on the right, Campbell Soup, Revenues 100, cost of goods sold 65%, so only a 35% gross profit. Uh, selling general and expenses of 20%. If they had anything like what uh, L'Oreal's got, they wouldn't have any profits. And an operating profit margin, not dissimilar actually to our friends at L'Oreal, 15%. Both of them suffer 5% input cost inflation. You'll see L'Oreal goes from a cost of goods of 27 to 29, rounding. Campbell's goes from 65 to 69. Our L'Oreal has a 7% fall in profits. Our Campbell's has a 22% fall in profits. This is a big safeguard fundamentally against the effects of inflation. Um, this is a, an interesting piece of research produced um, only in the last few days, actually, by GMO again, Greg and Mayo Van Hoffelen. And what it looks at is not just the fundamentals, which I've, I've looked at in those last couple of slides for you in terms of the effect of inflation, which I think does show that if you're going to be in a period of inflation, and I'm not certain that we are, the whole point of the first one is I'm not certain that we are in a period of persistent inflation, but maybe we are. I mean, you, as you know, you don't, uh, hopefully you don't think you invest with me for my ability to make macroeconomic predictions. I hope you don't. Uh, but if we are, I think fundamentally our companies are quite well placed. This is a piece of Grants and Mayo of Analog Research, which looks back uh, nearly 100 years, but looks back to 1933, and it looks at periods of inflation. So it actually looks at eight periods of high inflation uh, during this period. Uh, and it looks at the return that you get on quality. So it's got its definition of quality, not dissimilar to our own. Then it looks at the return on quality with a value overlay, trying not to overpay for it. And it compares that with the S&P. And bear in mind, in all these comparisons we make, our fund versus the S&P 500 in terms of its fundamentals or its returns, and in what these guys are doing here, we're giving the S&P an advantage in these comparisons versus the value investor, because the value investor doesn't own the quality stuff that we own. Uh, and in fact, really, a great comparison would be the S&P minus the quality. That would be a better comparison. But even so, when you look at periods of rising inflation, you can see the returns. So if you take 1933 to 35, quality returned 14.4%. 
quality with a value overlay 14.7 percent the s p returned 4.9 okay uh, if you come more up to date you can see 1988 to 91 14.6 uh, for quality 14.3 percent for quality plus value actually there's a slight detract on that one 11.8 percent on the s p and if you look through all of those which i haven't uh, done for you on there you would find that quality outperforms the s p in 75 percent of the cases of rising inflation and quality plus value in seven out of the eight instances basically quality continues to be a relatively safe place to invest if we've got inflation esg as i said earlier i think it's impossible these days to have a discussion on this even on a fund that's not a doesn't uh, uh, bill itself as a sustainable fund without saying something about the, the subject. I think this is an important piece of research. Um, this is a, a piece of research that was produced earlier this year, uh, and you can see that it uh, it has a rather snappy title of um, Honey, I Shrunk the ESG Alpha. You can see at the bottom of the slide there, uh, risk adjusting ESG portfolio returns. And the reason I think this research is important, of course, is it happens to agree with something we've been saying from the outset of our own ESG efforts, uh, which is, Academic research shows that 75% of ESG portfolio performance is due to quality factors. You know? um, basically, if you focus solely on ESG factors, so you look at all of the things that we look at in terms of ESG, so you look at carbon footprint and hazard of waste production, water consumption, energy consumption, um, you look at the, uh, the governance factors in terms of balancing the workforce and the management, um, et cetera, et cetera. All of them, you look at reputational risk indicators uh, and, and, and fashion yourself a portfolio for ESG factors without looking at conventional business quality factors, things like return on capital employed, gross margin, cash conversion, uh, spending on R&D and product development, organic revenue growth. If you ignore those quality factors, you are making a mistake. The bottom bullet point says it all. ESG investors looking for investors, pardon me, get my false teeth back in, looking for value added through ESG scores are looking in the wrong place and would do better to consider quality factors to achieve outperformance. The um, somewhat snappy way I would I've always put it from the beginning is there's no point owning a fantastically compliant company which basically disappears. It's not going to do anybody any good. It needs to have conventional. Uh, wisdom in terms of the quality of its business as well as the ESG factors. I mean, one of the companies I would point to for that uh, is L'Oreal. L'Oreal is, my, in my view, one of the most unsung companies that I've ever seen with regard to this. It's not only got fabulous operating metrics of the sort that we love, but it's also regularly tops uh, any of the surveys which are done uh, of ESG for major companies. Um, and it does so without going around doing lots of virtue signaling. I think it's a it's almost a poster child for this uh, hybrid approach, if you like. Now, none of that is to say that we don't take ESG very seriously. We do. Uh, we have full time staff working on it now, one of whom's got a degree in environmental science, uh, I might say. Um, if we look back through our database that we maintain, our research database, we have over 6,000 ESG based notes on over 70 companies that we've written during the period that we've been in operation. Uh, they consist of 384,000 words. So think in terms of, as it says here, around about 1,673 A4 pages worth of notes. I know on its own that it's what's, what does it matter if you write stuff down unless you do something with it? I quite agree. But it's not to say that we don't have a very significant effort here to refer to. And we have at 99, it's, I'm going to get them to do an extra one, so it's a nice round 100, uh, different topic tags. What does that mean? All of these notes that we've written from our engagement with companies, from reading their annual reports, from meeting the management and so on, are translated into these topic tags. So whenever we're looking at a topic, or if you want us to look at a topic, you go, I'm really worried about palm oil. I'm worried about deforestation with palm oil. I'm worried about uh, being able to trace sourcing. I'm worried about child labor. Uh, or false labour, we can go and pick up the, the, the tag on palm oil and look at everything we've ever discussed or written with a company uh, in relation to that topic and give it to you, basically. So uh, we uh, we do have this database, uh, which we've formulated. Good. I just thought I'd give you three kind of live examples of engagement with companies just briefly to illustrate that. So it's not just, oh, we write a lot of notes, OK? McCormick is uh, our company, which is the world's leader in producing spices and condiments. It has a clear um, uh, issue responsibility, however you want to describe it, with regard to supply chain. This is a company that has to get supplies from parts of the world 
where ESG considerations in terms of sourcing are very important. They're buying vanilla from the Saba province in the northeast of Madagascar, for example. Um, and what we like about them is their head of, of supply chain responsibility and sustainability uh, is somebody who uh, basically grew up in farming in Africa. Uh, he probably knows more about this subject, or has forgotten more about this subject than most of us will ever know, because he's actually lived it on the ground, literally on the ground. Um, and what I also like is he's formulated or helped to formulate within McCormick something which is realistic. They've gone from grandiose pronouncements along the lines of we must make our entire supply chain sustainable to uh, achievable yardsticks. You know, by 2025, their statement now is that they will make their top five ingredients sustainable uh, amongst them. And I think uh, making those things which you can put down as very clear KPIs and hit is important. And if I jump across to Unilever, we've seen that get across to Unilever from our engagement. Their, uh, their basic sustainable living plan, SLP, had similar uh, statements basically about making everything uh, sustainable in terms of supply chain. It now talks about being 100% sustainable within their key agricultural crops. And I think it's much better to see people actually focusing upon what I think are, are really achievable um, uh, targets in this regard. Brown Foreman, the one in the middle, uh, is the distiller of Jack Daniels uh, Tennessee whiskey. Um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, Tennessee whiskey is basically matured in oak barrels. And uh, therefore, you know, using oak barrels clearly uses a, a wood that takes quite a long time to grow. Um, and I, what we like about this is that they have moved from the position that an awful lot of companies have in this situation where they go and buy themselves a forestry investment. They go and buy some certificates saying they've got a, a forestry investment somewhere. They're actually planting oak groves uh, down, in, uh, down in where the, 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 the distillery uh, is based uh, in order to, uh, it was Louisville, Kentucky, to, uh, to develop their own sustainable supply of oak for their barrels. And I think that's a very practical, rather than just, yeah, we can tick the box on the form because we bought the certificate. I applaud it, or we applaud it. Other topics to touch upon briefly, because I'm nearly up on time. Um, you will have read some, if you bothered, some screaming headlines during the half year, during the great rotation that was going on. Uh, Fund Smith sees run of flows outflows as growth stocks slide. Investors begin to drop star stock picker Terry Smith's 360 million pounds flows out UK's largest fund, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you read all about it as we say at the top there. Um, look, on the right there are the growth sales redemptions and the net sales. And you see we had two net redemption uh, periods out here. Uh, the first quarter of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021, we had 620 million net flow out in the first quarter of last year during the uh, the big pandemic scare and 470 million during the first quarter of this year when we had the diametric opposite, which is the big flow of money into value stocks and uh, and rotation into uh, companies that were being bought as uh, reopening stocks. Um, I mean, if you take the first half of this year net, I think you'll find between those two numbers there, uh, you know, there's about 130 million pounds of net outflow uh, in the first half of this year. I know, I'm, I'm not blase about it. We are not blase about it. Um, but it's not a big deal, basically, in relation to the fund. I mean, the, yeah, to give you a, a sort of um, a number to compare it against, that uh, compares with about three billion pounds placed on the value of the fund by its performance in the first half of the year. That's a far more significant number for us to think about. So, you know, I, I think, you know, these people uh, like to write headlines. Anyway, moving on. I think that's it. Great. OK, no, well, thank you very much for that. Um, and um, thank you, everyone, for uh, listening in and also for your uh, tremendous support. Um, as Terry mentioned, the OIC fund now is 26 billion and our CCAF fund is nudging 7 billion. And obviously that uh, wouldn't be possible without your uh, support over the years. So many, many thanks for that. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. To all the team at Fundsmith, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Our team of advisors are available if you have any further questions. Further information on the fund discussed can also be found on our website, midirect.com.mt.